Coming to you live from the Stream.TV studios in Hollywood, California, Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, The Recording Connection, and The Blackbird Academy. We are going to discuss the art of the remix. We got a brand new ITL. We've got a very important Pensado Awards date. Let's get this train out of the station. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Yay. What's up, everybody? Glad to have you with us today. It's going to be a fun day. We're <laughs> Herb just knocked the crap out I'm of sorry. me before the show. <laughs> I'm What's so up with that? It was a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I apologize for the inside joke, but uh, you guys have, have created an environment for us where we just get happy and giddy every time we come in here to hang out with you guys. That is true. Herbert, what's up? I'm good, man. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the night we had during oh. during the week. Uh, that was quite a night. Uh, a lot of stuff. Should we get to well, it? Well, no. I mean, it sounds like we had a date or something. I mean, kind of amplify a small amount on that. Yeah, In the studio working. Where you had a, a, a date to mix. Okay, good. Okay, how's that? Okay, that's good. I can right. accept that. Great, great, great. Hey, gang, always great to be with you. Hope your week was absolutely rocking. Vintage King family, shout out for just being so damn Vintage King, <laughs> right? Always <laughs> yeah. cool, always on your game, yeah. always taking care of your customers and clients. We love you guys. Same yeah. with the Blackbird Academy, just excellence personified. They're in prep mode for both their live class, pretty badass. Their upcoming, their upcoming studio classes, equally badass. We also have some cool interactive video and ITLs between their camp and our man Dave over here. Those are being done. We're going to bring all that to you. Lots more coming from that camp very soon. Speaking of you, thanks always for your continued likes and subscribes. We remain on bended knee in gratitude yeah. <laughs> and hope that you will continue. Uh, that stuff is big, big, big for us. Real important note, for the Posado Awards, our, for all you producers who, who bought in and bought packages, our Google Hang with Dave, myself, and a couple of our pros, we're figuring out who those guys are going to be now, will be Saturday, April 12th, 10 a.m. Pacific time. That's Saturday, April 12th, 10 a.m. Pacific time. By the time you view this, it will give you about two weeks. Will Thompson will email all you guys who are to remind you and get you locked in. If anyone wants to become a producer between now and then, Go to fundanything.com forward slash Pensado. Again, about two weeks to lock in your schedule. And at that time, here's what we'll do. We'll get your input on categories. Dave and I have picked some categories that we think are important. We'll get your input on that as well. Then together, we'll all vote and finalize that very important area. So April 12th is importante. We'll be happy to talk to you producers. You guys have signed in, been very patient. We love your support. Um, so that's coming. Um, after all that is put to bed, the next up will be the voting members to submit and vote on nominees. So first up, April 12th, Saturday, 10 a.m. Pacific, is the producer's Google Hang. Talk to Will. He'll get you all, all that information. Just for your calendar, since you now have that date, the other important date is the big event, right? Yep. June 28th. Getting bigger every day event. June 28th. That's a Saturday um, at the Fairmont Hotel in Santa Monica. It's going to be the Pensado Awards, and we're just going to have a ball. Uh, again, go to fundanything.com forward slash Pensado to discuss and support, get questions answered. It's all coming together. Last but not least, our Recording Connection boys, thanks for the meeting last week. Love the plans that are in place. Um, their concept, as we keep telling you guys, is learning where you live. Um, they care about it, they execute it, and they're going to do some things that are going to be a great benefit to all of our audience. All that soon to come. Um, that was all the homework. We got that out of the way. Shall I talk about that night just a bit? Please. Okay. So you guys have experienced this. Um, periodically, you just have a time in the studio that's magical. and It doesn't matter what level that you're doing this on. Sometimes the people in the room are correct and the night is correct and all that kind of stuff. We had one the other night. Dave, in his modest manner, is mixing 
Michael Jackson's first single. L.A. Reid is overseeing that, who is the CEO of Epic and one of the best talent scouts. Scout is not even the right word, just one of the best CEOs in the game, responsible for tons of artists. So L.A. and I started out together. We were <clears throat> really trained by the same person. So by the time I got there, <clears throat> it was Dave, L.A., John Nettlesby, Cole. Um, who? Craig. Craig Burbage, a few others hanging out. The bottom line is <clears throat> everybody forgot their positions. We just enjoyed the music. We hung out for four or five hours. And I'll tell you one of the things that all of you have or should have that L.A. has that makes no difference in terms of money or stature, which is passion. Absolutely. We watched a guy who was bouncing out of his seat for four straight hours <laughs> just loving music. Yep. And, um, and, and I'm always a little bit sensitive that sometimes we might be on air talking about ourselves too much. It's just because we're enthusiastic. I will tell you that my partner was flat out brilliant that night. So, brother, <laughs> I'm, you know, I've known you a long time. That room was smoking, <laughs> let, let alone your mixes. Um, um, but L.A. was telling me what he thought about you and what he thought about your vision, and that's a guy whose opinion you trust. So the record is cool. Epic was cool. L.A. was cool. There's an upcoming the star, Sharif Barry, right? Yeah. The VP of, of a &R for Epic on the West Coast. Love him. He was chilly, just ridiculous. Can I toss one thing sure, in? Sure, please. Um, a, lot, a lot of times it's easy to slam the guys in the record industry, the executives, as being money grubbing and all this but my experience experience has been um they're not they they have a a responsibility to keep the, the the company funded but it was so cool to have my faith in the industry reaffirmed that night because la you and i both known known him 30 years yep and man he was the same guy he was 30 years ago in that little studio in atlanta just rocking out he he clearly enjoyed being in a studio um, he literally said to me, I'm back at home, and here's the difference between him, because I knew him pre-Atlanta, mm -hmm. I knew him here, is that the Jerry Curl's gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I missed that yeah, one. <laughs> it was, it was, but he was still dapper. Still, so the point being is that the enthusiasm was the same, the passion was the Absolutely. same. It was such a great time. So we'll, we'll get off our horse. Um, the guy this show's named after absolutely killed it. Uh, L.A. Reid killed it. Everybody was on their game. John Nettlesby was brilliant. I was doing my thing. We had a we had a good. I wish we had recorded that. That was a great. Me too. It's a great time. Plus the record, the music. Yeah, it's a great song. And the album has heft in it. You know, I, I was always a little concerned about post Michael records. Mm -hmm. This reaff reaffirmed my faith yeah, in that. Timlin uh, Timlin did the bulk of the album. And, and J Rock. And J Rock. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm telling you. I, I think he raised the bar significantly. I think he leapfrogged the competition with what he did on this. That and combined with L.A. Song Sense. Yeah. Well done. And obviously, shout outs to John Nettlesby and John McClain for sure for the thing. Absolutely. All right. Enough about that stuff. You've got a brand new ITL. Why don't you intro it and let's get it on. Uh, Cole and I were messing around the other day, and I used the word messing around accurately with some plugins, and we ran across this, and we want to share it with you. It's a pretty cool way to do reverbs. Sometimes uh, I run across a track and I want to get a little more energy out of it or, or the, the performance at that point in the track or sometimes the sound of the way it was recorded. Uh, there might be a, a, a way to squeeze a little more energy out of it. This is a technique that'll help you do that. Now, I'm hesitating to kind of describe it to you because the description of it is hard to do because, well, let me just show you, okay? Look, check this out. Great performance, everything perfect about this. And um, this is, this is um, with just a couple of effects, a, a little bit of slap, um, a little bit of harmonizer, and a parallel compression chain. You go to the party, I'll, you go. Now, I like this vocal, I like this performance. It was recorded pristinely. And I wanted a little more, so what I did was, Cole and I had been experimenting with some reverbs, and, and um, um, I can't remember who did what, but basically he and, I, he and I came up with this combination of things. Now, what I did was I, I, I rolled a little bit of the mid-range out, and I took the reverb return up an octave. So here's my return. I'm sending right here. We're sending pre. 
Now this octave gets fed into just your generic um, D verb. And I, I chose a generic one just to show you that it, it can be cool. A little bit long. We could, we could throw in a pre delay if we wanted. Now what gives it the color is decapitator. You can use any any plugin you want that adds color from what we call distortion, but it's really kind of enriching the harmonics. And a harmonic enhancer of any sort, just crank the crap out of it. That'll work really good too. Now let's check it with with it. You go to the party out. You go to the party out. You go to the party out. That's what you're hearing. Go to the party out, you 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 go. Now watch this, you go, ah, oh, Dave, that's kind of crazy. I don't like it, but let me take it out, watch. You go to the party out, you go to the party out, you go to. It, 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 I'm, uh, it's a little loud, so don't, don't, don't interpret this process by where I've got it set. I'm, I'm trying to exaggerate it to show you. But but raise it up slowly and you'll hear a point where the energy starts to come in. Watch you go this. to the body out, you go to the body out, you go to the body out, you go. I hear the shift right around there. Now what I did here is I duplicated the track. I took the pitch shift off and now I've got something extremely cool. You go to the body out, you go to the body out, you go to the body out, you Now listen to this. Listen to this, just, just the two reverbs. Regular pitch, octave up. There's something about that octave, that distortion, and all that stuff mixed in that just takes his performance and, and, and kind of selects the best of that performance, emphasizes that, and allows you to access to that. Let me show you let me show you how that sits in the track. You go to the body I'll go. I find a way to make you be mine. Now you you see all these things that are turned off. Let me show you let me show you how I used it. Oops. You go to the body I'll go. I find a way to make you be mine. So, um, I think it's kind of cool, guys. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Keep those cards and letters coming. And uh, I'll see you next time. One of the great things that we've not had a chance to cover in the, in the 150 some odd episodes, but it's such a prevalent part of the music space is the remix, yep. right? And it's it's an art form. It's an art form that covers lots of spaces, and we have got a giant in this space. Welcome to our desk, Dave Aday. Dave. Thanks for having me, guys. So the, 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 as before you pose that, just for context, <laughs> sometime this year he'll get to his 100th number one single, just for context, to show you how bad this boy is. It could is. happen during the show, in which case the dancing girls will come out with the cake. You know what? They, and it, it might be Cole dressed up as a dancing girl. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> uh, maybe not. we had a rough week. <laughs> Fire away, David. Uh, I'm conflicted uh, uh, as, a, as a bit of a foundation. I, I started my career in California doing remixes with Wolf and Epic. We did the Velvet DeVoe remixes, so they're near and dear to my heart. Um, do you approach doing a remix where you take a given vocal and a given track differently from crea than creating something for a club? mix? Well, uh, first of all, when people hire me, 99% of the time, they're hiring me to do a remix of whatever song, specifically for the clubs. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why people hire, most of the time, that's why people hire me. Okay, mm -hmm. So, so you, for you, the, the, two, the two distinctions are married into one. Yeah, I just, you know, people want their song to be played on the, on, in the club. Sometimes I'm remixing club songs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a country song like Leanne Rimes. I did a couple for her last year. I heard that. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, I've done every type of genre into a club song. Songs that should never have been club songs. Mm -hmm. I've made club songs. <laughs> that you know, corn song? I've done six corn remixes. Six. Oh, wow. well, I heard a couple. Yeah. Wow. Jonathan. See, see what, that's what's fascinating to me about that space is that 
the tool can be applied across genres. Now, it's d different levels of success, but people now think about, because back in the day, it was only a certain kind of record that could be a club record. It was sometimes well, it was an urban record or a dance technology record. Technology changed completely, that. Completely, completely changed it. Yeah. And now I see, I mean, I was playing a, a Blake Shelton remix <laughs> to the boys around here for about a month in my car just because I was fascinated that they went there. So you see it across genres now much more? You know, it's... I see it across every genre. Yeah. I mean, what did I do? I just did uh, 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 Fever, did Peggy you really? Lee. You just did Let yeah. It Go, too, didn't you, recently? I just did Idina Menzel, Let It Go. Another record, people probably wouldn't have thought to put it in the clubs. Mm -hmm. And just because I do a club mix doesn't mean it's just going to get played in the clubs. It, it's getting played in cars. It's getting played when people go running or walking or so drive. streaming you know. services. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. but it's not just for clubs anymore. It's just a maybe an um, up-tempo version of a song that just gives it a, a sort of a different, a different life. On the uh, Adina Menzel, Menzel thing, <clears throat> for the remix, did she use the John Travolta version of her name? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to call the the John Travolta remix. There you go. They wouldn't let me do that, though. I, I don't know why. <laughs> it's kind of weird. When I first started doing remixes, the, the single would start going down the charts a little bit, and then they'd take my remix and add that to the radio, and it would bring it back up as a way to stay on the charts longer. So it's, it's morphed over the years to kind of what you're doing now. You know, things things morph as, as technology comes into play. And the remixes really weren't around. Uh, you know, there was remixes in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And remixes then were actually remixes, mm -hmm. where, right? Because there wasn't multi-track remixes. It was like extended versions, cutting tape, yep. and forming Shep Pettibone was the guy you yeah, know, in the 80s. He was the man. And sure. Shep was doing you know, all, those, all those great Depeche Mode, yeah. uh, Pet Shop Boys, all those cool bands that wanted extended versions for the clubs. But that, the term stayed. And instead of calling it reproducing, because that's kind of what I do is reproducing, yeah. mm -hmm. they just, the remix is kind of a cool term, and it kind of stuck around. On mm -hmm. a song like Partition, how do you get the vocals? The company, the record company gives them to you? Or? Yeah, this is the great, you know, I get asked this question all the time. Wait, the record wait, company. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Are you just saying I ask normal questions? You're asking, I can't believe it, because I've, I've seen some of the questions you ask, and they're not, they're not always normal, but I get, no, I get, I get the, the, uh, the Pro Tools stem session usually. Oh, wow, you're mm -hmm. lucky. I, not all the time. Uh, on the Beyonce, I did. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, when I think different genres, I think, like if, I, if you say hip-hop, I think 808, or I might think trap music, or if, I, if you say blues, there's a certain type of thing you have to do for blues. What's the vocabulary for uh, dance music? Is there, we know we've got, we know we got to have some sort of four on the floor going. What are some other things that it has to be or it cannot be in terms of what you do in, in remixes? Well, it you know, like it's, it's, more wide open it's than funny that thing. you just use that word trap. I think that's, that's great. Because that's a new thing, and I, in fact, the Beyonce, it's actually a trap mix. That's right, that's what so, brought it So, uh, it really, it's funny, because it really isn't a dance mix, but trap's getting played in clubs. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the dance or club uh, genre. But I think dance music, you know, you just have to have a really good beat. If, I always say kick drum, because as stupid as it is, <laughs> if you don't have a good kick drum... You don't have a good dance song because you're not you're not going to dance to it if there's no mm -hmm. if there's no kick drum thing there. you know mm -hmm. and a lot of people uh, a lot of guys making music think to be creative or to be cool or to be uh, have success they have to change up their kick drum and I say you know what you get a good you have a good kick drum stick with it <laughs> there's no reason I mean and there's a new plugin that just came out Nicky Romero just came up with a great new plugin that lets you tune kick. It's got a kick drum, one kick drum, and you can tune it, change the attacks, change the releases. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the new way of the future rather than sampling a kick or using your same kick and, and having to, to maybe tune it a little bit. Mm -hmm. You can just type in what key you're in and change the attack, change the release in, on a plugin, mm -hmm. and now you've got a kick drum. Uh, uh, is the use of Vengeance samples diminishing now? You think this will replace that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Why would you want to go have to hunt for a sample that's in the right key and maybe have a certain attack or a certain release uh, or a transient that when you can just make one that just fits your song? I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. <laughs> okay. We're talking about kick drums. The people that tend to not like dance music, the thing that they complain about the most is the steady four on the four 
kick drum. Yeah. The people that like dance music, the thing they like about it the most is the four on the floor kick drum. Why, why shouldn't everyone like a four on the floor kick drum beat? Is it strictly a dance technique? Is that, is that it or is it? It's it just like uh, breathing. You know, uh, you know, you breathe a certain way in and out, and kick drum is just just the kick drum, the four on the floor kick drum, is just something that you put in club music because it just kind of keeps you going. It helps keep the rhythm going, the song going, and gives you kind of something to bounce your head to, mm -hmm. and at a, a specific tempo. I think I've been at 128 for the most part of the last seven years, mm. which is crazy because before that. You know, uh, in the er, in the 90s and 2000s, it was it went up anywhere from 120 to 135, 138. Mm. I think I was at late 90s. Wow. And mm. uh, but last seven years has been 128. But the kick drum just really is something there to keep you going. It's the song shouldn't be defined by the kick drum. The song should be defined by the song. Mm -hmm. Dave, one of my favorite parts of all dance songs is the uh, breakdown. I love breakdowns. I love listening to the breakdowns. I, I, I feel like I can get a measure of a person's creativity by how they approach the, the obligatory breakdown. Um, why breakdowns in, in, near the middle of a song? You know, it's, it's funny. That would be the drop. Right? The drop. It's <laughs> called the drop, you know. And it's, it's, I didn't even know this term existed until, you know, the last probably year or so. The kids are all calling it the drop. Exactly. And you have to have a good drop or else the rest of the song. And most people, most EDM listeners or dance music listeners, they go right to the drop now when they're listening to music. When they're on, when they're on Beatport.com or wherever they're buying their music, they go right to that and listen to that. And that has to be good or else they're not going to buy it. They literally, they judge the drop. I they, see it in my own it's house. It's like, you know, the most important part of the song. If you don't have a good drop. So does that force your art? And, and as you think about drops, get creative. I don't think, think about the drop. I think about the song. Okay. That's, that's me. Okay. But that's just my day by day. And that's people hire me for the song. They don't hire me for Got the drop. It. There's Got other it. guys they hire to have a great drop. And maybe it. they don't have a great song. But you've got good drops. I do drops. I'm not saying I don't do drops. But, <laughs> You're you know, not drop agnostic. It's just not, I'm not focusing, <laughs> oh, no. I'm not focusing on the drop only. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's just, to, in fact, that's kind of the last thing, I, one of the last things I do. Gotcha. Because if the song isn't there, the rest of no. much of, yeah. no, the rest of it's going to be Kick drum, there. song, and then drop maybe. Gotcha. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> What, uh, one of the things I've always enjoyed is when you re remix a song that I've done. One of my favorite, I'm going to go back a little bit, but uh, Buttons, Pussycat Dolls, a number one song. Your remix on that was great. I stole the kick drum from your remix. Come on. It. I did. I used it later on. I can't remember exactly what song. I think that's great. That you're the first person I think I've talked to that's sampled me. <laughs> and that makes me very proud. It's Absolutely. a proud moment in my life. Somebody... And and you even with the Pussycat Dolls, you did the television show, right? And I did the you TV were, show. You were in Robin Anton World, Robin, Ron Fair I was World. Music director, Ron Fair. Sure. Nicole Scherzinger, all the girls. That's right. That's right. Lots of fun and drama and stuff that goes fun along with girl bands. That's right. Which is fun and drama. And great songs. Yeah, yeah. You and know? a good run. On the on on, on your mix of um, Never Forget You, um, Lena Katina. Uh, I always said Lena, but I just got... I call her Lena Katina, too, but I found out it's Lena Katna. It's ah, like Elena. I knew the Lena. Lena Katna. Lena wow. Katna. Because I, I just actually interviewed her uh, for a little YouTube thing, mm -hmm. and she corrected me. She ah. was one of the two girls in Tattoo. Yes. And, and, and a buddy of mine signed them, and I had met her. And Who's I'm, your buddy? Uh, Martin Kersenbaum. Of course. Cherry Tree. Yeah. Yep. Sure. He's the man. He's the man. The, the thing that I love about that mix is you seem to take a week to get, get into the song. Like, how many, how many bars is it before I get to the first verse? 32? 16? You're asking me, but I would say sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's either 16 or 32. It's probably 16. And in my world, I have to get to the verse in four bars. Um, how do you pull that off and, and, and keep it interesting? Is it, is, does it go back to the sound of the kick drum again? No, it doesn't go back to the kick drum. Uh, you know, keeping it interesting, there's two ways to look at it. Because I, I, I always have a club mix. And the club mix, mm -hmm. I usually know, I don't have to have too much interesting things going on the first 16, 24 bars. Because people are, guys, if they're, deep, if they're playing it in the club, they're just mixing it in. Right. So it doesn't, and you don't want it to be too interesting because then that's going to fight with the stuff you're mixing out. Mm -hmm. 
So and I, I usually try and get interesting maybe on a radio edit of the club mix I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. where I'll try and get interesting if I'm going to get interesting. And then I'm doing the same thing you're doing and trying to figure out how to cut off those first 24, 32 bars and mm -hmm. get right into the verse or mm -hmm. the chorus or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. When I first started doing remixes, we used to put 64 bars because the DJs had to line up the two songs together in their headphones. Remember those days? Yeah. Now with, with Ableton and everything, you can do it automatically. Um, I live for the two and the four, but it doesn't seem to have that much importance in the remix world. And that particular song doesn't really have a two. It's just one, two, three, four, and it's not one, two, three, four. Yeah. It's like, it, uh, do you ever see a, a time or is there ever a time when you emphasize the downbeat, the two and the four? Um, you know, that was really, that's a sound that hasn't really been around uh, in the club world for a while. Um, Armin Van Helden had a couple of really good big big hits in the 90s that were really 2-4 based. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was kind of, you know, kick, snare, kick, snare, I don't know, kind of a country pop sort of mm -hmm. feel more than a club thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that could definitely come back. But you guys uh, put these little mm -hmm. tiny snares on the 2 and the 4, but you can't really, yeah, you have to need a microscope to find them. <laughs> <laughs> Just give it up, man. It's insulting. Breakbeat. It's insulting to the two and the Ooh. four. Breakbeat. You're talking about breakbeat. Breakbeat's two and four. Breakbeat's still around, but it's not big right now. Ooh. If break, and I think breakbeat could come back because breakbeat was really big in the '90s. And if that comes back, the two and the four is going to come back. But right now, it's still just the one, two, three, four. Ooh. Ooh. There was a um, there was a song you did with um, the guy from Erasure, Andy Bell. Yeah. What was the last song you did with him? I love that. I love that song. It's the first song I've done with him. Actually, it's coming out on Tuesday. Oh, cool. And it's a, actually, it's, this is actually a single with Andy. It's called uh, Here We Go. And Andy is my favorite singer of all time. So my life, my career has kind of come full circle because I have a, a single coming out with my favorite singer of all time How cool next is that? week. That's very and cool. it's good. I heard it on your um, a SoundCloud page. Yeah. Mm. It's pretty cool. Thank you. And, and another one I like is... The, is um, I forget what band she was in, um, Cicely Treasure. Cicely Treasure, she was in a band called Shiny Toy Guns. For She's in a couple bands, but the last band she was in was Shiny Toy Guns. Uh, mm. Grass is Greener is the one I like. You like Grass is Greener? I love that. Good, it's, it's, great song. Mm. I like it because she's got, it's, it's, it's one of the few times I've heard a dance song that had a, an alternative kind of attitude to it. And, and her vocal has just attitude for days, and, and it's reflected in your production. Did you work on that with her? Did you? I wrote it. I wrote it with her. Yeah. So we co-wrote it. The whole track it. has that attitude. I think she helped with that. Well, that's. I love it when people talk about stuff that I've not just done in the last two months, and it's that means actually uh, that you might like it. So that's. Uh, thank you no, for I love that. It. I love thank it. Thank you. It's a. Sicily's um, great. It's a great song. Do you find that that? <clears throat> so I always watch this during our days coming up. Do you find that physically, periodically, you need to go to the clubs, see what they're doing, what's going on? Or well, you... I'm usually at the clubs on the weekends. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I DJ probably four or five times a month. Okay. I was going to add, that's really... Yeah, no, I've been question. DJing as long as I've been producing dance music. Good. And that's, uh, you You have to be Yeah, you're in the, in the lab. You can see it right <laughs> there. It's re reaction. You can see trends. It's reactions. And it's, it's just hearing what everybody's playing, too. Exactly. That's a very important part. Exactly. Even if you... And you know... Look, with technology and the internet, you can pull up YouTubes of guys playing everywhere. So you right. can you can really hear a lot of stuff there. Mm -hmm. But it's important to go to the clubs. You have to see how things things react. The energy is completely different. Totally. The environment's different. Totally. How sound works inside a club, which is different than other environments, yeah. correct? And DJing, look, DJing helps you kind of... Uh, it teaches you arrangement. Uh-huh. You know? Absolutely. Because DJing really is arranging, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. It teaches you, you know, highs and lows mm -hmm. and dynamics mm -hmm. and when to do this, when to do that, how long to play this. Mm -hmm. Also teaches you that's not working, you better play something else. Better get out. Absolutely. You're yeah. controlling energy, <laughs> literally. And yes. the crowd responds to that. When somebody's a master at it, it's amazing to watch. I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm a master at it. I just enjoy DJing. Yeah. Uh, I love DJing. And, do you do uh, it in L.A. or where do you do it? I play everywhere. Oh. I play L.A. a couple times a year. Oh, but cool. I, I'm everywhere in the United States. Oh, cool. You're every a, weekend. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. That's great. Do you do you go into those into your gigs with a, a set list prepared or, or or one just organized so you can take the temperature of the it's room? It's a great question. 
I'm old school. Finally. Old school. I'm uh, <laughs> especially old, but I've been I've been DJing long enough where I just kind of uh, it's like I have a box of records. Mm -hmm. So basically, except today, I have a thumb drive <laughs> with, right, right. with a, a library of records on there. And uh, before the before each event, I kind of just make a folder with a bunch of songs I'd like to play. Yeah. And then I just but I, I don't I don't plan it out. I have no idea what I'm going to play ever. And I think that's. For me, that's part of the magic of DJing. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of the, by the seat of your pants. What what percentage of this? If this is an unfair question, don't answer, please. <laughs> okay. What percentage of your set is material you wrote yourself? Usually, that's a, another good question. Um, probably not role. as you're much. A couple questions. Yeah. You're on a roll. Uh, probably people probably expect me to play a lot more of my music uh, during my sets. I could play obviously the whole set could be all all Dave stuff, right. it, but I just don't. I've been DJing so long. There was a time when I was, when I started DJing, where I wasn't playing Dave Aude stuff for a mm. long time. Mm -hmm. So, I just want to play great music, and sometimes that means some Dave Aude stuff. And I've, I'm always making you know mashups and bootlegs. That's really the new one of the newer things that's come around in the last few years, is to do your own. In fact, one of the biggest things that's come around in a few years is nobody just plays the song. Mm. Everybody always just chops the song up. So. You know, I definitely try and play some Dave Aude stuff, but uh, I also want to play big stuff from everybody. I don't want to limit it just to Dave Aude stuff. That, right. That's called a concert, mm -hmm. I think, right? <laughs> kind of. And that means your fee needs to go up. So yeah, my fee goes up for the concert. If your manager or somebody's not taking over, call me out. I got you covered. <laughs> uh, back in the early 80s, I went to uh, that same club, Confetti's. No, this was a different club. And, and the Dixie Dance Kings, the great record oh, yeah. crew from the South. Uh, I had a lot of friends in that. And they, they used to have a, a DJ contest. And, the, and back, it was back when there was, to quote Beck, two turntables and a microphone. And I was blown away with some of the skill set that those guys had in making songs blend together. In that you've been doing it for a moment, I guess you'd be the best person to kind of, the uninitiated to the process, can you give me like a, a, a 15, 20 second timeline from two turntables and a microphone to where we are now? Because I think a lot of people would be amazed at how computers play such a huge part. And yeah. you used to have to show up with a semi, now you show up with a laptop. I carried my own equipment for years. And I mean, I remember just saying to myself one day, right. if I have a chance not to carry this equipment won't and just- crate, it and won't be. Yeah. yeah. So today I walk in with a thumb drive with my music and headphones. Take me back to when you started, what did you do? When I started, I had uh, you know turntables. Uh, two SL 1200s techniques, and that, that's still, I think, the turntable. You can't really, you know, you can't really, you can use other turntables, but that is the vinyl mm -hmm. turntable. Because of the way it, uh, you can change the, the Just, pitch, the They're speed. solid, they're made mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the best made turntable, and they were, they haven't changed in 30 years. Because mm -hmm. they, at that time, it took a lot of abuse. I mean, it, it's, yeah, you, yeah, yeah there, was, there was other kinds, but those SL 1200s, they're heavy. And you, you know, so because when you're scratching the record or when you're doing anything, mm -hmm. cueing the record, mm -hmm. you don't want the turntable to move. So, so right. at that time period, you had you had turntable one. You had, you had a song that's playing on turntable one. Yep. You've got your headphone. You're listening and cueing up another song yep. on turntable two, mm -hmm. matching the speed so it'll flow. And then on your little on your little mixer desk, you you morph one song into the cross other fade. song. You cross now fade. you go back to this and put a new record on this. Yep. And was it Serato that was the first thing that kind of changed all that? Or how, how did it no. go from there? What was the next phase? The next phase was CDs. After, after vinyl was CDs. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I played vinyl up until, uh, I was making vinyl and playing vinyl up until 2005. Mm. Oh, wow. So actually not as nice. long ago as you think. Yeah. And people are still making vinyl. Vinyl is still very popular. But so 2005, I went all CD, mm -hmm. burning CDs every week to play in the clubs and, and went from that to went from putting you know 15 songs on a CD to you know what I'm gonna put one song on each CD so kind of going back to vinyl sort of uh -huh. so I'd have a song on each CD mm -hmm. so I'd go turn around grab a CD with one song play that get another CD play that one over there so it was mm -hmm. kind of like a vinyl CD thing and but you're you chewing had, and doing yeah, everything with yeah. the CD yeah correct because they because the CD players the pioneer CD players are just as close to vinyl as you can be without right. playing vinyl right from there. Uh, I skipped the whole Serato uh, uh, computer thing because for me, I don't want to look at a computer when I'm in a club DJing. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of feel like I'm 
still playing vinyl. Mm -hmm. So I went from right from CDs to thumb drive. Okay. Mm. And so thumb drive goes in, and there's a screen on each CD player with you know, all your tracks, and you just pick one and, and hit enter, and it loads it. And the turntables are, you're still kind of, you're kind of mixing turntables still, mm -hmm. but it's with CD players. Got it. Got Can it. you, but it's mixing the, I'm sorry, let me cut you off. So you, on the thumb drive, you've got the, the photo, you've got the song up on the screen, mm -hmm. and you can manipulate it. You can see it with the waveform on the screen. Got it. Got it. Got so it, got it helps you. you can, there are lots of cheats on these right. new CD players. I mean, you, you can uh, hit a button, and it's automatically uh, uh, pitch, putting, keeping everything in the pitch no matter what, the, what your tempo is, mm -hmm. right? On the fly. So live uh, pitch and live, and you can also, uh, you can also ahead of time, throw your files into a program called Mixed In Key. Mm. So every one of your files tells you now is metadata stamped what key it's in. So now you're mixing wow. two songs in the same key. Wow. So, it sounds, they sound, so you have a folder of songs, you say, you know what, those are two in the same key. Let's put those two together. Make that transition easy. There's a lot of cheats now. Yeah. So <laughs> when you show up with a thumb drive, I'm sorry, I'm always thrilled about this. So you show up with a thumb drive and yeah. a headphone, yeah. and then what's waiting for you is everything else. Booze, people. There you go. <laughs> women. Yeah. Uh, people on the dance floor. There you go. Dancers. Computers, laptop, whatever uh, it is. Eight, you know, uh, they got the CO2. <laughs> and you're good to go. In a weird way, it, it seems... Oddly more complicated than two turntables <laughs> and a microphone, but much simpler to carry, I you guess. You know what? It, you're right. It could be, because you know what You know what it is? There's more, more choices. things to do. More choices. Yeah. I can do all these things. Yeah. Me, and I'm not the guy, you know, doing all the crazy effects, and there's guys that bring, you know, tablets and stuff, and they're doing all this stuff. Me, I want to play a song, have a little drink, play another song. Yeah. I'm still doing the same thing I was doing when I started DJing turntables. Okay. On CD players, I'm playing a song, playing a song, playing a song. Having a drink. Not trick. Having a drink in yeah, between yeah. and having a good time because that's what it's all about. Yeah, because if you're having a good time, that translates into what you're doing, which translates to the floor. It's about having a good time. Yeah. It's not about put a spotlight on me and watch me DJ because that's what it's turned into, which is fine. For me, it's about I don't need a spotlight on me. I want a great sound system. Let me play some great music for people to dance to. Let's 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 uh, let's accomplish two things with this question. Yeah, I want you to share it, it, everything you're comfortable with about your your work process and, and and your workflow and the equipment you're using. Not in detail, but just let us know a little bit. And then at the same time, take me to how you created your mix of partition for Beyonce. So you get the vocal. You've already heard the song. You listen to it. You go into your studio. What's next? Well, first thing I decide is my tempo. Mm -hmm. And the original uh, Beyonce, I think, was like 93. Mm. And so I told the label, I said, look, uh, I don't want to do a club mix on this because it's, I've done that a million times and the vocal sounds bad. Mm. I want to do something different. They said, you know what, Dave? Do whatever you want to do. Which was like, okay. Cool. I got Beyonce and I can do whatever I want to do. It's Not pretty bad. exciting. Yeah. So I decided to do something, you know, one, one uh, what did I end up on that one? 110? One yeah, I thought it was a hair faster, but you would know. 110. Okay. 110, trap, and whatever, trap or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I listened to the original, and I thought I could just make something, take the original sort of vibe and pump it up, put it on steroids. Mm -hmm. And so first thing I did was just kind of, I, first thing I do is put the vocal in. And I'll put into Pro Tools. Into Pro Tools. I'm a, I'm a Pro Tools guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, arrange it. Figure out the arrangement, you know, verse, chorus, pre, whatever. And once I do that, uh, start putting drums in. So you don't, you don't, as, at, at no point in your process do you go into Ableton Live because it makes some of that a little easier. You just go straight into Pro Tools and match everything. Up I've yourself. learned how to do things in Pro Tools pretty quick. So okay. you know, for me, I'm just Pro Tools beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So we've got the vocal. You've, you've selected a tempo. Do you serrato the vocal to to keep it in pitch, but lengthen it to that time well, uh, to I'm, go to that BPM? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm using Xform, which is Pro Tools, uh -huh. internal, you know, right. which I, because I, I think, and, it, and I, if I didn't use Xform, it probably sounds just the same. I just started using Xform years ago when, when well, DigiDesign had that Xform plugin. Yeah. So I still kind of have that, it's still installed, and so I still go to that, but it's so quick now, because I'm on a native system, mm -hmm. so the native systems are flying, and uh, it doesn't take very long to, to so, go to the new so, tempo. The original had a little bit of trap in it. You liked that, so you preserved the the, the Atlanta thing. Yeah. And and then pumped it, it up. The first thing you do is select a kick drum 
and then add and then put that in to give you delineations that you can uh, just start making a beat you know okay. I just start building a beat and it's usually it could be around a chorus it could be around a, a verse whatever mm -hmm. I just loop eight bars or two bars or something and just did you, did you sit down with the original record and figure out the chords, or did you create the chords from just the vocal? Uh, I did not, because I, I usually don't want to be, uh, I want to kind of figure things out myself. Mm -hmm. So you just and, use the vocal to tell you the chords? Yeah, I use my ear, mm -hmm. which is the most important thing. Well, I like that because it, it, you can come, there's, there's a million chords for every note. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, and so a lot of times that's what I like about remixes is that... Um, you can do something new. Yeah, yeah it I, feels I, original. One of the things I like about what you do is is you create a hip, hypnotic feeling with a with a kick drum, but what moves your tracks tends to be the high end information like your hi hats, your shakers. Mm. I love the way you use tambourines and hi hats and shakers. So now we're about to add the hi hats and shakers to the mix. Tell me your philosophy and why you do it, and teach me something at the same time. Well, I don't know if I could teach you something, anything. That's a that's a pretty big one, but. Um my philosophy is I just kind of got to figure out if I'm going to do some kind of shuffle or if I'm going to have a straight, a straight beat because mm -hmm. I love things to have a little shake. And mm -hmm. uh, Do you remember, like in the old MPC days, we'd go to yes. 60 for, for 55 swing. is my favorite. 55. I love 55. Okay. I'm an that's MPC quite, 55 that's, guy. That's swing. That ain't shuffle. I one. love the swing. Okay. Yeah, it's swing. Cool. It's not really a shuffle, I guess. It's a swing. Yeah. Okay. So I love that MPC 55, which they have in Pro Tools quantization. So. Right. I, I'm using that whenever I can get away with it. Not every, not every song, uh -huh. and I didn't use it on the Beyonce, but um, I do try and try and use that. But, but I come also from sort of a drum loop mentality. When okay. I started making club tracks, okay. uh, a lot of guys, uh, like when Todd Terry was sort of making big rec records, that's kind of when I started, and it was everything was loop based. Mm -hmm. So I still come from that loop sort of mentality. So I go and listen to a lot of records that are hot right now that I'm playing and kind of get some ideas. And if I can kind of steal something here and there, I will, mm -hmm. or borrow something. But I, I always try to make things uh, sound new. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I'm not the guy that's gonna just take, you know, four bars or two bars of right. somebody's thing and make it mine. Okay, so now we got, we've got our kick, we've got our hi-hats, we've got our vocals. Loops, we've got vocals. Got our chords, our loops. Now chords. What made you think of that horn sound? That's the coolest, like, horn sound in that song. I don't know. It just. Uh, I it's, think that's a hook. It's so good. It is a hook. Well, you know, it, you know what? I'll tell you what made me think of that. Do you want to know the truth? I do. That's why we're uh, here. Uh, the, the big track on the radio right now by Jason Derulo. Ah. All right. Got Come it. on, man. Got it. There it is right there. Right there. So I heard that because that, that's inspired me. I'm like, man, that right. is. I heard that in Amsterdam when I was there in October, and I'm mm. like, that, before it, before it came here, and I heard that we were in a uh, in a taxi driving somewhere, and I was like, "Wow, that is a hit record!" Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what inspired me. Mm. Wow! Mm. You is... get inspiration from from other records, and, absolutely. But the two don't sound anything alike, right? No, no, no. I I, I would have never thought about that because no. that's one of my favorite songs. I, I what I did think of was there was a, there was a time in the '80s where everybody had a Barry Sax in it, and then there was a time in the '50s where everybody had a Barry Sax, and then back. Uh, before I was born, Barry Sachs got in some of those big band things. I just like that low, guttural, I yeah. guess it's not really a square wave, it's more a triangle wave sound. It just, every song should have a triangle wave in it somewhere. I, I'm a big, 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 big. <laughs> I can't wait to ask you this question. Uh, you used a term, um, I can't remember how you said it, but it was basically the mathematical part of music. Do you remember saying something about the mathematical part of music? And the mathematical elements in electronic music was what you liked? Well, I'm a math guy, first and foremost. I, I mean, I like numbers. Okay. Um, and I think anybody that makes music has to like numbers, uh, produces music. Because it's always, and especially in dance music, maybe more, it's a lot of fours and eights and twelves and sixteens. And, you know, you kind of have to know a few things mathematically when you're making music. So it's important to to have that mentality when you sit down to, to, to write something. Okay. Especially in my world, because my world's not a, I'm, I'm in grid mode all day long, every day for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. I don't come out of grid mode, do I? Mm -hmm. So you have to be sort of mathematical mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> music is mathematical when it's, but the greats make it have feel, you know? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. Uh, good job, Dave. 
What? How do you take your grid world and make it have feeling? Because your records have feel in them. Well, I think one way is the vocal feeling for you know because there's two ways. There's multiple ways to get feeling, as you know. There's ways to uh, have things sort of sit with each other uh, as far as where they are at in context of where they begin and end. Mm -hmm. And there's another way. Uh, the way I kind of use uh, dynamics, and I do a lot of filtering. So I'm doing a lot of high pass and low pass filtering mm -hmm. and level changes. For instance, I'll tell you a little trick I, I have um, that I do. And whenever I, I do these little seminars around the country, um, people always see my Pro Tools session and they're like, what are you doing? And they can't believe that I'm actually, my verses are usually 2 dB or 2.5 dB lower on the master fader than my chorus. My chorus, I always pop it 2.5, uh, 3 dB louder. Mm -hmm. That's with that's smashed, by the way. So mm. it's not you're not really going to hear. Right. But the chorus, I give a little bump, and a lot of people don't ever think about that. They think their master fader should just be one line, mm. and they don't ever think about actually pushing things, do they? Well, not me, but yeah. You, <laughs> not you. <laughs> I'm not talking but about do, you. Not you specifically. I don't, Come on. I don't do two and a half. <laughs> two point four nine. <laughs> but, but no, I rarely do I go past the DB. DB. Dynamics. Warm up your arm source, batter's box oh, time. Let's, okay. uh, uh, let's get that going. Are you ready to fire well, away? Well, because he's, I'm with Dave all day, I'm, I thought I'd go box. high tech. So he this is, is taking the rods and you throw it down. That's right. Oh, by the way, I got to have some lessons for Tornado, the, the, the app for, for the iPad. I'm driving everybody around me crazy with crazy. my little DJ app. Yeah, yeah it's funny I have to, to have watch it. I have to have an EDM moment every hour, and I pull out my little app and I'm a, yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know if that's a good thing. But it's not. It's, uh, it's completely not on any level. I think maybe level. you should go to Candy Crush or something like there that. But, uh, which but I do. Far I just, away. We're I just out love clock. it. <laughs> piano. Uh, piano. Yamaha. Yeah. 808. The real 808 is what I'm going to say. I love that. I actually like own one. Sounds like a TV one. show. <laughs> no joke. Yeah. Um, lead vocals. McDSP ML4000. Ooh. 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 There's, a, there's, a, there's a headline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stereo bus. Stereo bus. Uh, MV2 is my new thing that I love on the stereo bus. You know what? I just, that's so weird. I just discovered that plug in. Oh, thank you. It's in my, it's in my bundle. It my should waves be. bundle. It's, I'm using it parallel. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> hold on. I broke my own rules there. <laughs> Bass. Bass. Uh, I'm going to say uh, Tony Maserati plugin. Ooh, my guy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not very deep. But, snare. Know. Snare. Um, for just because I'm crazy, Lynn. Lynn Drum. It came up the other night when we were in the studio. Mm -hmm. Remember? We had this big discussion That's about so Lynn cool. Drums. I knew, I knew I liked me some Dave all day. <laughs> <laughs> Reverb. <laughs> Reverb, um, well, I, I miss lexicon, so I'm going to say lexicon because I'm missing lexicon. Mm. Not necessarily because I'm using lexicon, I'm missing lexicon. Mm, like Have that. you tried the UAD when it's really good, the UAD 225? I, just, I got rid of my UAD, but it's okay. Mm. Okay. Another conversation. <laughs> Delays. Delays, age delay for everything. Oh. I keep forgetting about that. I, I don't know, know why. Um, well, you know what? Let's respect our, our little horn sound. Horns. Horns. Um, That's something you always think about in dance music. Well, I mean, I use a lot of stock old Roland. So I'm going to say Roland. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, and last but not least, I'm going to throw you a curveball just because you're kicking my butt. <laughs> Strings. <coughs> Excuse me. Strings. Omnisphere. Mm. Okay. You ain't got to say it. Well, remember, baseball runs in his family. So he's the, he's the older brother of a, of a, of a major leaguer uh -huh. who played in the major league. So you see his bat speed is really fast, connects uh -huh. with the ball really well, uh -huh. you know, well, runs the bases. If, you, if I've been doing this a while, I should be able to answer some of those questions. No, it shouldn't be, you Killed know. it. Killed it. True. Absolutely. Give me one quick second here, guys. He's pulling something up. So, What's he pulling so up? while you Dave's know, pulling that up, Chongo, are you over there? Yeah. Hanging out. How are you? All right. Our clock is running. Why don't you ask a couple questions while Dave gets ready? Sounds good. I got, I got three. So what are some uh, production methods that you use to maintain the energy in the breakdowns? Production methods I use to maintain <coughs> energy in my breakdowns. Well, um, something that's important in your breakdown, I think, is to keep the dance floor going. Yeah. 
So a lot of people think a breakdown means you just got to get rid of everything. Right. For me, I try to keep something going. And, and lately it's been, you know, a clap. Mm. Just And it could be a clap filter down. It mm -hmm. could be a kick with uh, a nice high pass filter. Mm. So you're just here. Or it could be a low pass filter. Something the audience can hold on to and something stay there where. Four on the floor. Yeah. Something four on the floor keeps going through the breakdown is coming, to keep the people tell. going so yeah. they don't lose their momentum. Exactly. Exactly. Chongor, give us another one. Michael Romero, what kind of production mistakes do you see up and coming remixers make the most often? Good question. What kind of production mistakes? Um, the mistakes, that's an easy question for me, and I think it's people uh, smashing their mixes beyond belief. Mm. Mm. Dynamics Just because, are, yeah. In a live world, dynamics are everything. Yeah, and I, I mean, my mixes are smashed, but I think, I think people tend to uh, smash them too much. Mm. Hmm. It's an easy thing to do. Sean Gore? This last one's from Joey Loana. When you approach Remix, do you imagine what you want the final mix to sound like and work towards that, or do you start working with an open mind and just see what happens naturally? I'm going to say uh, uh, door number two. I just, <coughs> just kind of let it flow, and I always start the mix fresh and new. Mm -hmm. I don't kind of work off the last mix, so I think it's important just to kind of have a clean slate and uh, see what happens. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Rock day. Everybody, roll your hands in the air. Wow. Act like you just don't care. Wow. This is like he's at confetti again. He's at confetti with a slight case of Ebonics. <laughs> <laughs> just a nice one. Nice one, bro. That was, uh, <laughs> that was 128 just for you. That was, thank you. It took, how, how long did it take you to get to 128? <laughs> Actually, I don't know what it was. It wasn't 128. 123. Well, now that you've come to our complete madness, <laughs> and actually you saw I a had version to have of, an EDM moment. You saw a version of Dave that none of us have ever seen since <laughs> he's got that program. I'm thinking he's doing that at every show. I don't no, know. I got to tell you, it's, it's more fun. He scared me in the studio the other night. We're in the studio. We're in the middle of this mix. We got CEOs of Epic. He goes, wait, everybody, hold up. Besides the fact that your colognes are, cl are clashing, <laughs> and he made this big deal of all the people at expensive clones. He then broke down and had like a two-minute Dave EDM moment, just him and the program. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, be quiet. Let I matched up a couple of yours. Yeah. Yeah. He was funky as hell. Yeah. Funky as hell. Funky as hell. That was a, that's a club night, you know. You know what, though? Uh, um, dance music has always, for me, symbolized creativity. Whenever I, I get stumped and I feel like I'm not being as creative as I should be, I always, I've always gone to the dance world for the last 25, 30 years and found, we, we mentioned Shep Pettibone, he was a hero uh, in terms of my stealing stuff from him. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just a great inventive world. There's not too many genres left. Herbert, where where anything goes, right? You know, when we first started in the hip hop world, anything would go. Now it's got formulas. Now it's got a vocabulary that must be there and can't be altered, unlike unlike it was back in the day. And I think the last great frontier of just the wild wild west and anything goes is what I like is that it's become a permanent part of the landscape now. Thank you can you. feel the force of it. Thank you. And you can yeah. see the impact of it. It's not this sort of other thing. It's a thing. <laughs> and you it should be. It's all, all genres should Absolutely. be represented, you know. Absolutely. It's, Do you have a Nostradamus moment for us? Is there like a 10-second prediction where we'll be in 10 years with this? I think it's just going to keep going. I, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping it's not going to be 128 for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. but you I think it, I, I, I think it's going to slow down right now. <clears throat> I think we're coming out of a, uh, a real super techie, uh, hit-you-over-the-head style and going back to some more songs a la like Disclosure-ish mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And just slowing it down a little bit. Because cause the, all, the, all the young kids that have been going all the raves the last few years, they're growing up a little bit and they'll want to hear some songs. So that's why I think we're going. You, cool. you know what's interesting about having you here? Two things. One is what Dave and I are trying to do um, with this show, and sometimes we take our version of it on the road, so if we could ever coordinate schedules with you in some of the events where we either go teach or talk to people or do things, we, you'd be great as a guest. So if that's ever of any interest to you, standing invitation. We, Absolutely. We'd love to have you. Um, the other thing, too, we were talking earlier, um, our kind of crusade along with our audience to, to just make sure 
that some of the uncelebrated are celebrated with the Spensado Awards, and you were, what, what's your take on that? Do you, do you see that need? Because you guys are doing such uh, incredible work. No, I think, I think there's a need. There's a lot of people in business that don't, you know, don't get credit mm -hmm. uh, because of just the way the world has gotten to mm -hmm. with media and TV and, and internet and stuff. So there's a lot of people that aren't recognized that I think, that I think it, would be, it would be wonderful if they had a place, they could be recognized, mm -hmm. and uh, that would also keep some sort of the politics out, out of, of it, it a little bit. I just bit. thought of a new category: worst DJ. I think I just, I think I just worst <coughs> DJ. I think I just might have put myself to the head of the, the list. About you don't that. want to well, celebrate the worst DJ. I got no? some news for you: it's the one award that's already been voted on in the category, and I won. Early congrats! <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you for having me. Yes, <laughs> thank Thanks, you, Dave, DP. Fun. Take us home. Uh, hanging out with you guys this week is, uh, has been the punctuation mark so far on what's been a great week. I hope to have a, a, a wonderful Thursday, Friday. We're heading up to uh, April Fool's Day. Uh, you won't find me on any April Fool's jokes this year, so have a great week. We'll see you next time. <laughs>